Russia's assault on Ukraine in 2022 represents the most serious geopolitical crisis since the Second World War, and the first time a country has sought to expunge a sovereign nation from the map of the world since the Nazi era. And yet, at the heart of the war is a mystery. Vladimir Putin apparently lurched from a calculating, subtle master of opportunity to a reckless gambler, putting his regime and Russia itself at risk of destruction. He also thought the regime in Kiev could be toppled in 10 days through a blitzkrieg operation carried out from Russian and Belarusian territory. But what led him to these beliefs? Drawing on over 25 years' experience as a correspondent in Moscow, as well as his own family ties to Russia and Ukraine, journalist Owen Matthews seeks to explain this mystery in a first draft of the history of the Russo-Ukrainian War of 2022 to 2023. With its panoramic view, Overreach is an authoritative and highly detailed record of the conflict that has shocked Europe and the Western world to its core. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe if you like our guest speakers, as it will help other people to, un, uh, to discover the great content that we produce. Owen Matthews is a British writer, historian and journalist. His first book, Stalin's Children, was shortlisted for the 2008 Guardian First Book Award and the Orwell Prize for political writing. He is a former Moscow and Istanbul bureau chief for Newsweek. Owen is half Russian, speaks the language to a native level, and studied modern history at Christchurch, Oxford. From 2006 to 2012, he was Newsweek's Moscow Bureau Chief and is now a contributing editor at the magazine. In 2014, he reported for Newsweek on the conflict in eastern Ukraine, and this year wrote one of the first substantial books on the full-scale war overreach, Inside Story, of Putin's war against Ukraine. Welcome to the channel. Thanks so much, Jonathan. What a wonderful intro. Now, that was that was quite a substantial intro there. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll put some timestamps into the video so people can skip it if they want. I'm sure they won't. Um, well, let's get to this first question here, which is the uh, central thesis thing of a book: is that there is a mystery at the heart of the war. Now, what will historians be debating in future years in terms of this mystery? Well, the mystery is uh, is very simple um, because seen from outside the Kremlin and see or seen objectively, uh, Putin's invasion made no sense. That's the mystery. Why did he do it? Um, and it only starts to make sense when you actually start to see it from the Russian point of view, uh, or rather from you know inside you know that. Kremlin information bubble that Putin inhabited for um, basically since the beginning of lockdown uh, and the people around him and their and their worldview. Uh, because uh, the premise on which the war was ostensibly fought, I mean, there were several, there were the, there were the pragmatic ones and the ideological ones, but the pragmatic ones, uh, as stated by Putin, was that he wanted to denazify Ukraine totally mystifying. It's really strange. I mean, there obviously are Nazis in Ukraine. There are also Nazis in Russia and Poland and Germany. But, you know, uh, there is one ultra-nationalist member of the Supreme Rada out of 450 of the Ukraine's parliament. So, you know, clearly, you know, Ukraine is obviously not run by Nazis. So that's unexplicable. That's a mystery. Why do they claim that Ukraine is run by Nazis? Why do they think it needs to be de denazified? The second thing, uh, the second stated aim, was to prevent NATO from using Using Ukraine as a as a platform um, as and create a uh, sort of anti Russia as Putin and many of his close associates um, you know call the Western project um, uh, in uh, uh, you know the West's project in Ukraine and also Ukraine's project to Westernize itself is described as an attack on Russia by the Kremlin insiders, uh, which is also you know, a little bit mystifying. It's a little bit of more, more, more of a complicated answer. But um, the idea that actually Ukraine was, is, you know, was before the war imminently about to join NATO was actually very far-fetched indeed. Mm -hmm. And the third you know, uh, logical, uh, the, and the third practical demand was to save the, you know, the Russians as the Kremlin describes it, I mean, what they mean is the Russian speakers of Eastern Ukraine from "quote unquote" genocide, which is also, you know, mystifying in any sort of, you know, to anyone, any member of uh, 
what uh, George Bush once called the reality-based community. Um, it's mystifying because even by the uh, accounts of the rebel Donbass republics, the, uh, I call them the LDNR, the Lugansk and Donetsk Narod Narodne Republiki, the, the People's Republics, even by their own accounts, even by the numbers that those rebel republics themselves submitted to international bodies, including the, the UN and the OSCE, the actual numbers of people being killed in the fighting, particularly after 2000, um, basically they they tailed off into you know low three figures uh, by 2016, and by 2020 there were you know, you know you know, basically a dozen civilians killed killed a, a year in Donbass. I mean, it's definitely not anything we're approaching a genocide. That's all absurd. So that's uh, that, that's just to describe, you know, why it's a mystery. Why did he do that? And the first and most simple answer to the mystery is he did it because he thought he could win. He did it because, like any human being, you know, like any, uh, you know, uh, like any rational actor he believes he believed at the time that the future would be like the past unfortunately um he was badly informed so i think one of the really important things to understand about um putin is that i don't think he's you know insane i don't think he's even particularly irrational <clears throat> the important thing is that he is just like dramatically wrong because he thought that three things were going to happen that did not happen the first thing is that he thought that the level of support for russian intervention in eastern ukraine was much higher than it actually was I think had he done this full-scale military intervention back in 2014 when he occupied Crimea, you know, he might have had a much better chance of actually at least annexing the Donetsk and Lugansk republics. He didn't do that. And in the intervening eight years, actually, his support for Russia in the eastern part of Ukraine fell dramatically much less for actually joining Russia. I mean, even pro-Russian sympathy fell enormously. The second thing that he miscalculated was that he assumed that Zelensky would cut and run, just as the, the, his uh, his predecessor, um, uh, but one, um, uh, yeah, Viktor Yanukovych, fled in 2014. He thought that Putin is convinced that the Americans created the Maidan revolution at the beginning of 2014. So, you know, if the Americans can do it, then we can do it. That was another miscalculation. Um, uh, they could actually do their own pro-Moscow coup in Kiev. They were convinced they could do that if they handed up enough, out enough money and corrupted enough people and did enough propaganda. Uh, they didn't think the Ukrainians could fight. Um, not irrationally, because the two times that the Russian regular army had, had actually confronted the Ukrainian army in the field in 2014 and 2015, the Ukrainian army was you know, completely destroyed and, and routed by the Russian army. Um, and lastly, they actually did not believe that the West would support Ukraine. And that also, from Putin's point of view, was not a totally irrational assumption. Mm. Because when he annexed Crimea, Crimea in February of 2014, the West came out with this chorus of disapproval. Angela Merkel said, this must not be allowed to stand. It cannot happen. It must be reversed and blah, blah. And like, surprise, surprise, 15 months later, in spring of 2015, Angela Merkel signs a $10 billion gas pipeline deal with Gazprom. So Putin makes a lot of assumptions about the weakness of Ukraine, about the indifference of the West, about the nature of Russian or pro-Russian feeling in Ukraine, and um, and massively underestimates the, the the fighting strength and morale of the Ukrainian army. So in in that sense, that in a nutshell is the answer to the mystery: is that uh, it's not that Putin just suddenly lost his mind. It's not that he suddenly became divorced from, uh, in a, if, from, from you know, basic reason. It's just that he was acting in an information bubble. He, he and this period of isolation. Uh, just sort of work, working on terribly bad information. And this period of isolation, which you mentioned, I think is critical, isn't it? Because, you know, up until, say, Balotna in 2012, there were many liberal economists within the Russian regime. He would have heard a multiplicity of voices even if he ignored them, there would have been, you know, different sources of information for him to feed into. But with COVID, he seems to have become ever more isolated and dependent on a small circle of advisors who themselves may be getting poor information or may have 
intense self-interest uh, in terms of feeding Putin a simplified story or even a full story. Yeah, I think that's an excellent analysis, Jonathan. I think that's exactly what happened. I mean, the, the story of the war is a story of the closing of Putin's mind. That's what it, that, that, that's really the bottom line of, of, of all of this. And uh, the uh, <clears throat> over the last uh, 20 years, the, the Putin has had, uh, the, the Kremlin has had all kinds of projects and ideas and initiatives and you know, they at one point there was a reset with uh with with, with the united states another point there was a uh, an attempt to make russia the, sort of the leader of world conservatism sort of, you know, communist international style there were all kinds of things that the, the, the kremlin tried and abandoned but all the way through rather like you know, the, the barman in the shining like the people who were always there you know in the room were the very old KGB cronies, associates, colleagues of KGB, uh, of, of Putin from his uh, very earliest days in the KGB in the 1970s. And that's specifically Nikolai Patrushev, who's head of the Security Council, who was, uh, in fact, Putin's boss in the late 70s and uh, certainly senior to Putin in the late, late 70s. And Alexander Bortnikov, uh, who's the head of the FSB. So um, these people were always hawks. They've always been in the Kremlin. They were always hawks. Uh, the difference was that they had been surrounded for most of Putin's tenure with other people, uh, and they're you know they're called the technocrats. They're called the liberals. Um, they're somewhat te technocratic and in fact not at all liberal. But one thing that these people were was the recognizably post-Soviet. In other words, they were pragmatists. And there were people who basically realized that, you know, which side Russia's bread is buttered is that, you know, all of Russia's prosperity, prosperity and much wanted stability of the Putin regime is 100% due to, you know, funded by Western money, which it gets from hydrocarbon exports, like full stop. That's it. That is the source and origin um, of Russia's prosperity. And, but those pragmatists um, by the beginning of 2020 had essentially left the room for various reasons and putin is finds himself in a sort of black swan event COVID comes along so just at the moment at that moment when putin is sort of most vulnerable to like his worst instincts and his worst you know and and his most um radical radically hawkish advisors at that moment, COVID comes in, and he finds himself, you know, in an even more. He was always in a, you know, in, a, in an information bubble. He was always isolated. He always had a very small number of interlocutors, but COVID just sort of locks that in, and he finds himself, you know, basically alone with, with his most paranoid and his most aggressive and oldest advisors. And that leads to my to my uh, next question or my hypothesis here. You know, in the early stages of the war. Um, you know, if 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 you uh, joined Twitter at that point, which I did in February of last year, you'd get into a lot of fights with so-called Vatniks, people who are saying, no, this is all NATO's fault. Uh, this is all the West fault, you know, trying to create a military bridgehead or a cultural bridgehead uh, from which to assault Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you speak to others like sort of Luke Harding, who's been observing this for many years yourself and other commentators, it's by no means obvious that, that that nato is is actually the prime cause of this and what we've seen as the wars unfolded is that nato ammo stocks nato military presence in eastern europe nato readiness for full-scale war has actually not been there it's been run down over many years especially the german military to a point of near incapability um so you know what is a better explanation for the war you, you you've mentioned this short-term political expediency um that uh that probably is driving putin's thinking um but is there also a long-term trend here where this kind of confrontation is inevitable when you get dictator syndrome where you get the paranoia of someone with total control over such a vast country as russia where you have someone trained in the KGB with that already sort of paranoid mindset that the sort of GRU KGB are imbued with. And then you have COVID isolation. Um, I don't know how you'd balance those two hypotheses there. <laughs> 
Mm. Well, asking whether something is inevitable is a bad question to ask a historian because they always tell you no. But <laughs> there's, there's, there's lots of dictatorships that have, you know, refrained from invading anyone. North Korea is a great example. So, I mean, uh, you know, clearly all those factors that you mentioned are important in the, you know, explaining why uh, why Putin took that that that, that bad decision. Uh, but just to return to your to your sort of preamble of your question about NATO, um, I think there's a really there's a lot of very interesting. Um, the, the 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 basis of the misunderstanding between Russia and the West over NATO is that you know everything is that Russia says about NATO is fundamentally true but trivial. It's a problem of scale. So when Russia says like, oh, America was giving military aid to Ukraine, they were, but it was peanuts. I mean, that infamous 2019 conversation between Donald Trump and Vladimir Zelensky, where Trump tries to shake him down and get him involved in the Hunter Biden investigation and so on. You know, how much money are they talking about in that conversation? As it turns out, that year, Ukraine, get, it's actually a very, uh, they actually get far more than they were, that they were expecting, is $400 million, $400 million. Now, if you are like a Russian Vatnik, that says like, oh my God, like NATO gave $400 million in military aid to Kiev. The U.S. spends two billion dollars a day on its own military. It's mm. literally six hours of U.S. military spending for a year. So it's a rounding error, you? isn't it? It's, so, 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 so what does that tell you about like how important Ukraine is? You know, the the, the Russians will tell you. But there were there were military maneuvers all along. You know, our borders, NATO maneuvers. There are NATO maneuvers on Russia's borders every year and there have been you know forever you know from you know, throughout the cold war after the cold war you know that they, they since since 2017 so it's since 2007 nato expansion that you know they've been closer to russia's borders but i mean it's really interesting when you talk to michael mcfall uh the former u.s ambassador and and uh, obama um uh, uh, ambassador to Moscow and Obama advisor, and he was literally present every single time Putin spoke to Obama through you know for four years, and NATO expansion and NATO exercises were not mentioned. Putin never said anything to Obama about that. It was so that so so the 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 the, the key point is that you know the. Uh, Everything that NATO has done with Ukraine appears provocative to Russia because they actually have no real sense of scale. And a really important, I mean, just like a sort of take a concrete example, there's, there's a, a naval exercise in the summer of 2020 called Nifty Dolphin. It's a Black Sea naval exercise involving US, um, Turkish, uh, Romanian, Bulgarian, and Ukrainian warships. It's a NATO exercise in the Black Sea. How incredibly provocative. Well, yes and no, because actually there are always naval exercises, NATO naval exercises involving all the NATO members, three of them, that border the the the, the Black Sea. So the the it, it's the whole NATO story is actually sort of very much in the eye of the beholder. Um so the 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 the, the question is the question that the Russians crucially did not ask was not is NATO actually uh, you know engaging in our neighbors who wish to join it because the answer is obviously yes the question that they should have asked but didn't ask it was actually how likely is it that Georgia and Ukraine are ever going to join NATO and the answer is you know before the before the Russians invasion absolutely zero and for a very simple legal reason which is not really discussed nearly as much as it should be and the legal reason is that the the NATO charter does not allow a any nation with disputed borders to join NATO so therefore already even before Crimea Ukraine could not legally have joined NATO Georgia, with its disputed territories and Abkhazia and and, and 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 South Ossetia, could not legally have joined Georgia. It was a totally abstract and non-likely event until Russia made it likely, and that is the tragedy in the sort of ancient Greek sense of everything that Putin has done. Is that actually he has himself, by his actions, created the conditions, the things that he has feared the most, he has made, the, which were not true before he acted, he made them true by acting, by doing the things that he did. And public support wasn't there either. Prior to 2014, um, 
I don't have the exact figures, but it was well below uh, sort of 50 percent or more required uh, in terms of public opinion, you know, irrespective, obviously, of these these key differences of, of not allowing a member with disputed borders in. And of course, has to remember that Georgia also has disputed borders, again, thanks to conflicts um, that are, you know, very expertly stoked and engineered by Russia back in uh, 2008. Um, but through its actions in 2014, and then obviously this year, Putin has almost created uh, that move, that lurch towards the West and away from the East. And similarly, in Sweden and Finland, I mean, there wasn't a, a majority of public support necessarily to join NATO until Russia's aggression drove people into the arms of NATO. Yes, that's certainly true. And actually, well, you might want to check out. Uh, I just saw uh, saw on the wires today that actually there's that there's there's a new allegedly Ukraine wide survey. I'm not sure quite how how broad, broad, broadly based, but even now, strangely enough, after uh, in a nearly a year of war, there's still only a narrow majority of Ukrainians that actually favour primarily, I mean, especially if you count the don't knows, by the way, very important in any survey, there's a lot of don't knows that get kind of, it's actually like in the 50s, you know, you know, 50 something percent, I forget the exact say, and it ver in, the, of Ukrainians actually favour joining NATO as the key to their future security. Um, and that's really significant. I mean, the, the and, and by the way, it's also uh, strongly skewed East and West in Ukraine. There's obviously like a very strong majority, a much stronger majority in the Western Ukraine, not surprisingly, for joining NATO and other others, and, and, and a minority in Eastern Ukraine for joining NATO. Uh, so the whole sort of NATO thing, uh, the, the, the NATO issue actually became, you know, something of a, uh, I mean, to, read, to say it's a red herring uh, trivializes it because it was certainly a very important part of of of, uh, of uh, Russian thinking, but it became just a sort of a, a, a bellwether of a much more important factor for the Russians. And that was something that has been described, you know, it was famously described by the um, American Deputy Ambassador George Kennan in his long telegram in 1946 about how Russians think, how the Soviets think. And that's a profound fear of encirclement and of Western aggression. And one of the most revealing quotes, uh, I think, my, my revealing of Kremlin motivations, um, was a comment made by Viktor Zoltov, the former Putin, the head of uh, Putin's bodyguards, now the head of uh, the Rosgvardia, the Russian National Guard, Viktor Zoltov, who said um, to Echo Moscow editor Alexei Benediktov a few years ago, um, Ukraine doesn't exist. Ukraine just happens to be where the border between Russia and America lies. So for them, strangely enough, actually, in terms of, you know, strategic thinking ukraine itself is just incidental it's a pawn because the high elite and they say this very often people like bortnikov and patroship and putin himself uh say repeatedly that for them this is really about a battle for survival for russia's survival against u.s aggression they honestly think they, they, this is this i think this is not just sort of blowing smoke i Profoundly, I think they actually are profoundly convinced that this is a war of sort of preemptive war of defense that they are fighting against Western aggression. I mean, you know, to 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 you and I, that may they may that may seem like utterly paranoid and you know borderline you know crazy. In fact, more than borderline crazy, just crazy. But I think the to, you know to people of that background, people of that mentality, they are convinced that the West is, particularly America, is working actively to undermine their regime and achieve regime change. And by that token, the, uh, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny in, 20, in August, August of 2020 and the invasion of Ukraine are part of the same project. It's, they're both about defending Russia from American aggression. And you know whether it's true or not. I mean, I mean, it's obviously not true. But the point is, the 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 the, the important thing that to, to understand is that's how they think, mm -hmm. and that's a really important factor in uh, that, that becomes a non-trivial question when you're thinking about sort of practical ways to end the war. And I think there's um, 
there's another layer there as well, because the, everything you've said there is definitely the case. And I think they they even think of Europe as, as a proxy of American power. They don't give Ukraine agency. They don't give Europe agency. We're all sort of pawns in the big game. But that plays back to an idea that Russia sees itself as this global power. They talk about sort of multipolarity, but it seems they still think of themselves in almost like a bipolar world with them against the US. And to me, that that harks back to something far more atavistic as well, is almost like a, a village pugilist. You know, um, he gonna, you know, if you're going to be the, the, the head guy in the village, you're going to be the roughest, toughest guy in the village, you're going to want to take on the next most tough guy and give them a good drubbing so that everybody knows you're the guy with the biggest stick. And to me, it has that that sense of the playground bully about it. And that might trivialize some of the huge global issue that there's, there's something sort of deeply uh, traumatic about the psychology, I think, of, of looking for, you know, the biggest, baddest enemy and then trying to pit yourself against them. Yeah, uh, you, you know, you're absolutely right, Jonathan. I mean, the, uh, I mean, just as the problem with NATO is, uh, is, 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 is a fundamental failure of perspective uh, and a fundamental sort of egotism. I mean, you know, countries are egotistic, just as people are egotistic, they're egocentric, I would say, rather as much as ego, ego, egotistic, they're egocentric. You know, the uh, the Russians in that Russian phrase, they, you know, they think that, that that NATO and Joe Biden, you know, spiat the they, 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 they sleep and they think and they see only Russia. Of course, it's not true, it's it's nonsense. And in fact, actually, they, 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 they one of Joe Biden's big election talking points in the, when, uh, uh, on the campaign trail was actually to disengage from Europe, to let Europe be responsible for its own, um, uh, for its own defense, which, by the way, Trump is it also was also Trump policy, and, you know, not really bother about Russia. And, of course, um, the Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, sort of famously said that, you know, it's a trivial, you know, it's a real, Russia is a regional power. Uh, for Joe Biden and for uh, on the campaign trail, the obvious strategic interest of America is China. That's that, that that's America's peer. It's in no way Russia. No one cares about Russia, except uh, I don't know whether you've ever owned a Jack Russell Terrier. I have. We have. We had two Jack Russell Terriers. I've you been know, these bitten are, by one, know, but I haven't owned one. Like, yeah. These these are like you know seven kilo dogs that believe they are seventy kilo dogs. You know they're just sort of they they they're just sort of they just think that they have no cognizance of the fact that they are like a little dog that you can literally like the size of a rugby ball you can kick it across the room but no they think that they are like as a gigantic rottweiler and you know they will attack enormous dogs and the enormous dogs you know will actually funny enough actually very often they be completely terrified by this attack but the but the the, the jack the jack russell analogy is 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 may, may may seem flippant but it's actually very um it's very illustrative that Russia honestly believes that it is the peer of America I mean, in their minds, uh, whereas in fact, I mean, if you look at the you know, you know, various metrics, but you know the uh, you know uh, relative GDPs, for instance, like Russia's GDP is literally thirty-six times smaller than NATO's, the collective GDP of NATO. It's not three times smaller; it's thirty-six <laughs> times smaller. It is like a tiny little minnow. And unfortunately, and, and and you're you you're very right to identify this as a really fundamental problem in Russian, not just in Russian psychology, but that psychology translates into a fundamental flaw in its strategic thinking. So, for instance, I mean, I'm just writing an article right now for the Spectator uh, about uh, you know why Putin's gas weapon failed. Well, Putin's gas weapon failed because. Putin thought that they were much more important than they actually are. They, you know, massively underestimated Europe's uh, ability to just to buy their gas from someone else. Like, you know, hey, presto, suddenly, you know, gas prices are now back to what they were pre-war, uh, pre-war levels. Although, of course, that would, pre-war they were already heightened, but that's a slightly different story. But that's not to do with the war. That's for you know various sort of, you know, zero, zero, you know, carbon zero and other other problems. But the um, the this constant obsession that Russia is much more important and powerful than it actually is um, has actually, ironically, you know, become the sort of the biggest and most fatal error 
of the uh, this, the error that caused the war is the error that will actually ruin Russia, which I think, I mean, when people say, when Russian friends of mine say, when acquaintances say, like, you know, you're anti-Russian, I say, like, excuse me, like, you're the one that's, and, you know, I'm very pro-Russian. I want to see a Russia that is, you know, you know, properly, that, that is respected where the best members of you know where it's best people see their future that is prosperous <laughs> that is you know you know properly you know ha has ha has the cultural influence it deserves rather than sort of trying bullying its neighbors and so on whereas you pro-russian people believe that russia is somehow sort of mystically historically doomed to live in internal serfdom and people you know have no agency and are and the only natural form of governance is you know violence and theft you know, um, the, the 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 real problem with the current Russian elite is that they actually have not let go of that Soviet mindset that they are the second superpower in the world, and that's and we can talk if you like about the how what that says about the way Russians governed and why it's basically a sort of sick gerontocracy, basically mm. it's sort of death cult of the past. But we'll definitely the... come to that in a minute because I think what happens next is is obviously unpredictable. But uh, again, you know, Western pundits, commentators will tend to try and normalize the situation and they'll tend to try and interpret what happens next through a Western lens or a Western, you know, political mechanic. And that, of course, is is completely wrong here because Rush could go in, you know, we think it's hit rock bottom. I think people will be surprised that it could get an awful lot worse than it than it currently is. And one of the things I really want to sort of drill down is, of course, you have a lot of friends, colleagues, acquaintances um, that uh, you've created through uh, many years of work in Russia. And you're one of the few correspondents who's actually been in Russia and Moscow uh, this year. Uh, to see how sort of society and, you know, people who were previously in the independent media, how they're sort of coping with the new situation. And it's it's not great, is it? I mean, you paint a picture of fear, paranoia, um, going back to a sort of mindset that was last seen, you know, in uh, maybe not even the 80s, uh, because, you know, back then the Soviet regime was already, you know, weakening, weakening uh, its stranglehold on people's minds. Um can you tell me a little bit about the sort of the the sort of fear uh, and reticence that you've you've seen amongst former colleagues and friends in Russia? Well, uh, yes, I mean it's 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 been it's been a couple of months since I was in Russia. I was there. I was last there. I last left in uh, mid October, in fact. But the um, I was there three times. Uh, I've been there for three extended visits since the beginning of the war. I was actually there at, that, at the beginning of the war. Um, the uh, concerning foreign correspondence, it is strange. Um, that basically all of the Western language, the Western correspondence just left en masse at the beginning of the war. But like, you know, the French and the Germans and the Poles and the Italians, they all stayed and they're fine. Um, so it is it is a bit curious. And for instance, Andrew Roth uh, of the, uh, formerly the Washington Post, now The Guardian, excellent correspondent, colleague of mine, went back in September and he's been working on this in September and he's fine. So it's not really entirely clear to me, like, why uh, the, I mean, I, I can see why the Western Press Corps left, is they left because of the Fakes Law, and they're afraid of being prosecuted. But, uh, you know, most of the rest of the Press Corps, you know, International Press Corps did not take, you know, took a different decision and they've been working there. And also the BBC and Sky News have been working there continuously. So it's a sort of rather, it's a bit of a mystery why so few journalists go there. I mean, partly because it's a pain in the ass to get visas, but I mean, they, they, are, they are giving visas now. I mean, they're giving journalists Visas for three months, but nonetheless, three months is three months. Anyway, to answer your question, uh, there is a climate of suspicion and sort of despair and sort of depression. That's true, but um, to say that there's any kind of serious crisis in Moscow, I mean, uh, there really isn't. I mean, they basically Moscow has ignored the war. It it literally doesn't exist. I was there on September 21st when Putin announced his mobilization. So at that moment, you know, basically up to that moment, the war was one million percent invisible. Well, let's say, I mean, it was the only visible parts of the war, let me put this differently, were literally like some posters at some bus stops with like military people on them. 
but like I tuned into you know hundreds of conversations everywhere I went, like you know packed bars, restaurants, theaters, you know. You know, parties, you know, li- you know I, I tune into people's conversations, you know, eavesdropping, um, and, you know, nobody's talking about the war. I mean, everyone's talking about, you know, uh, what's going wrong, you know, things are bad. Uh, you know, for a proportion of my friends, the war was totally disastrous, and they fled. You know, journalists, um, liberal, you know, political activists, you know, several hundred thousand people fled. But those that stayed, their reaction has been one of total denial. Total, like, willful denial. It doesn't exist. The shop shops are completely full. Um, you know, if you really want to get your sort of fix of propaganda, you can switch up on, on the television and get sort of the hysteria. But, I mean, already that's, you know, the people who do that, um, you know, rather marginal. So, so, so the, but there's a vast majority of people who are, you know, are, either are too poor to have left, or, you know, in terms of the middle class, most of them have too much to lose to leave, and they have no good reason to leave, because you know they're still managing to sort of do their jobs, and they've they, and they've got their their houses and their you know their nice cars and their and their jobs, and you know, they they have problems, but it's not a crisis. That's the really important thing. And after September 21st, um, there was, you know, a, a certain sort of rising note of alarm, dissonance, you know, people were scared, you know, there was another wave of, of emigration, a lot of desperate people queuing at the Georgia border and so on. But um, the, the, fundamental, um, the, the, the fundamental change, I think, has been among two groups of people, um, the, the sort of the the sort of liberal, politically active people who I mentioned who left. And the other change has been among, you know, pro-government people, you know, sort of propagandists, you know, people who I know who sort of one way or another work for the Kremlin, you know, officials, foreign ministry people. I mean, you know, friends, contacts that I've been, you know, dealing with in some cases for 20 years. And for them, the whole situation uh, was completely and strikingly different from the get-go because the government had done something that was utterly unpredictable and was utterly inexplicable and not predicted by them so in other words you know one of the reasons why i you know was i you know i never said that the war was would never happen but i said like it makes no sense that, that he's going to launch a war on 24th of february because there's been no pre- preparation for it you know, there was no popular preparation until, you know, people who, who I know who literally run television stations were not briefed on the fact that the Kremlin is about to launch a full-scale war. I mean, that's crazy. And that level of operational security was something, it wasn't so much the invasion, it was the fact that, like, it took everyone who thought they were well-connected with the security services, you know, completely by surprise. You know, Mikhail Friedman, one of the formerly one of the richest men in Russia, oligarch, you know, his government contacts. I mean, I think we can assume he has some government contacts. You know, a friend of mine, you know, had had a dinner with Michel Fried- Michael Friedman and his top level government contacts had like said, like, don't worry, it's not going to happen. You know, everyone who thought they had like an in, who thought they were connected, realized they were not connected at all. That suddenly, uh, that even a friend of another um, uh, person I spoke to who literally had, lunch with uh, Dmitry Peskov, Putin's spokesman, uh, on the first Monday of the war. So this person had lunch with Peskov, and Peskov claims, told, tells her in a private lunch, I mean, not in a sort of propagandistic way, they are, they've been, they've known each other for 20 years. Uh, Peskov tells this person that even at the Security Council meeting, in the Kremlin, on January 21st, sort of February 21st, that sort of weird meeting in the gigantic halls in Catherine's Hall of the Kremlin Palace, where he dresses down Sergei Narushkin, his foreign foreign intelligence chief, and so on. Only four people apart from Putin in the room knew of the full extent of the plans. And we're talking about, you know, the most powerful, or the most at least powerful on paper, men and women, men and women in Russia. So the rest of the elite suddenly kind of took fright. Because essentially what they realized is that uh, a system that had formerly worked, essentially, not for their interests, but had protected their interests, because the interest of any 
Russian bureaucrat is just to steal as much money as possible. Uh, so a system that had formerly worked on what the Russians called panyatia, you know, a system of understandings that you know you are you you are loyal, you kick up, you know, so, you know, so you kick back some money, you're allowed to get on with your with your Swiss bank accounts and your sort of chalets and so on. Um, suddenly, that system has been hijacked by a bunch of 70, 70 something year old. KGB agents, and suddenly, like you just don't know what's going on anymore. And furthermore, you don't know what what what, what the bounds of the acceptable are anymore in terms of discourse. You know, can you meet with Owen Matthews, British journalist? You know, is that that still okay? You know, people just got very paranoid and very confused. And and of course, it 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 also sheds an interesting light on the system prior to the war, doesn't it? The so-called um, hybrid informational autocracy which, of course, Navalny's team have pointed fingers at Vindictive, saying, you know, uh, rather than being a key opposition figure, you're a key cog in this illusory machine, this, this, as you say, this system of uh, uh, this balanced system that was by no means a democracy at all. But, you know, the liberals had their little media outlets. They could, you know, think that they had a, 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 a role in changing society. Uh, it was almost like a sort of media playpen. Um, but after after February this year, all of those uh, little perks, all those little illusions are swept away, aren't they? Uh, well, yes. I mean, you, 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 you clearly, Jonathan, have, a, have a quite a sophisticated understanding of how the Russian media landscape works, because indeed um, the um, there was absolutely... Uh, the, the liberal media was not only tolerated, but actually in a very weird way, actually encouraged by the Kremlin. And, you know, just a, you know, a, like a, an actual story of how strange Russia is and how unlike the Soviet Union it is and how so generous the whole system is and how you know, people who have just started become Russian experts this year, like literally have no idea what's going on, is is is, is Nova Gazeta. So Dmitry Muratov wins a Nobel Peace Prize for his fantastic work, and it is fantastic, uh, in Nova Gazeta, independent. It's independent, not because, I mean, it doesn't make any money, but it's formerly uh, financed by Alexander Lebedev, uh, the London-based um, former KGB colonel and uh, oligarch, or he's not really an oligarch, he's a mini I would say, but anyway. A liberty run out of money, he went broke. Uh, um, his son again, he runs the Evening Standard, as you know, owns the Evening Standard. Um, Lord Liberty. Now, but um, um, the Kremlin stepped in to find someone to finance their opposition, the, the Nova Gazeta, a opposition newspaper. And they found Sergei Adonyev, who's like a very famous. Um, uh, donor and uh, um, he um, <clears throat> he's funded lots of uh, theaters and he's uh, he's a telecoms magnate um, and he's done does a lot of business with Ross Nano with the um, so with Ross Tech which is Sergei Chemizov who's also a former KGB crony and Silivik and so on but you know the um, and uh, I can't for confidentiality reasons tell you who asked um, Sergei Adonyev. Uh, to step in and fund Nova Gazeta, but there were people like at the very top of the state, literally asked him, like you know, Siroja, can you please fund this opposition newspaper? And that tells you an awful lot about how the media environment worked before, um, before the sort of the the sort of complete departure or the, the or the, or the mm. what I think it, many people within the elite itself regard as basically. A sort of KGB takeover, and I don't. I, 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 I'm not misspeaking. I mean KGB, not FSB. It's yes. the KGB suddenly took over a system that had formerly been. You know, it was repressive. It, there are lots of you know, tragic, large amount of Nova Gazeta the journalists, several whom I know, and the Polikovsky included, uh, were murdered. I mean, they, 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 they were, they were hounded. There was. The, the space for independent media was extremely small, but it existed. And then it just suddenly sort of imploded. And uh, the uh, as, as for the um, Vindictive is a very interesting example as well, because Alexei, this Echo Moskvi, it's like a famous liberal radio station. It was, um, you know, it tells it how it is, uh, 
was one of the main drivers of Glasnost, in fact, in the 1980s. And then it was bought in the late, uh, in the early 2000s by Gazprom Media, I think it was 2005, 2006. It was bought by Gazprom Prime Media. So you have this weird hybrid. It's a liberal, sort of notionally, sort of, uh, it's not really anti government, but it's just, you know, sort of, and neither is it independent because it's owned by Gazprom Media, but like notionally editorially ind independent uh, news resource that is owned by Gazprom, which is owned by the state. So, how does that even work? Um, when you're dictative, I think it's it's really simple actually the rules are that there are like you know a few red lines that you cannot cross that allow you to operate in that media environment and i think you know uh in vindictive's case in echo Masqui, they did not interview alexia navalny that was their red line mm -hmm. uh in the case of dimitri muratov and uh, nova gazeta the it was they didn't write about putin's personal wealth mm. business. You know, there they was didn't go that, after the corruption of key chinovniki, or they they might have dealt with more no, lightweight issues. They did go after them. They, they, they did, but but just not Putin. Yeah. No, no, they weirdly wrote, wrote 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 actually quite a lot about the corruption of, of key people, but um of top people, but not actually Putin. So, uh, so the um there was actually like strange enough before the war a sort of tolerated you know independent media environment and that all collapsed um and the question is now sort of going forward is where do russians get their information from um uh most russians still get their information from you know the, the television but actually the numbers that we see um and i had a conversation with a senior um uh television executive in moscow back in, in september and uh the numbers are falling. You know, people fewer and fewer Russians are getting their information from from television news. And more of them, more and more of them, are getting it from. So they're television. tuning out from Solovyov, Semenyan, and all these sort of really quite uh, inflammatory uh, sort of figures. And I heard uh, I spoke to um, someone who sort of studies this at uh, King's College London. They said, and it actually happened relatively early on in the war that the viewing figures for the more extreme. Um, you know, combative propaganda formats, the numbers have been steadily declining throughout the war, uh, which must be a worry to uh, the Kremlin propagandists. Uh, I, it is It is a worry. I think that's certainly true. I mean, I've been... Um, one of the things uh, that people tend to forget is that actually, um, if you are a consumer of Russian television propaganda uh the tone and the timbre actually has not changed since the beginning of the war they were always as crazy as this even before the war and that's the surprising thing i mean i went i was invited for several years i, I stopped doing it in, i think in 2018 or thereabouts but i you know for, for a couple of years 2016 2018 i went on uh all these shows myself you know as a sort of weird masochistic exercise but actually it was it was for, for uh it was partly for in terms of journalistic interest it was quite interesting to see how the propaganda machine works secondly again journalistically it's actually a rather, rather important opportunity to meet i mean definitely not you know you know first or second tier people but you know the thing you know third tier people like the heads of duma committees senators you know duma members you know the governors you know that that, that kind of person who's like you know not really in you know in the room where it happens but nonetheless they're in the, you know, they might be in the building where it happens you know they, they sort of get the cafeteria gossip so you know the senators can sort of you know, it's, it's a for chit chat and party leaders of course um and the third reason was because i thought like if i'm not going to tell it how it is then how who will so i went on all these shows as like sort of a, the, the western whipping boy and get this sort of shouted at for an hour by vladimir zhanovsky among others um who um you know literally said like you, we, we we just send you to the gulag owen matthews but anyway but the point is that I mean, it's they... not unlike a democrat appearing on fox news right you'd get the same treatment uh <laughs> in format. that format as well, well you know, I, but I went on. I went on Solabio, by the way. I, I went. I went on sixty minutes. Uh, I went on the you know, Vrema, um What's it called? Vrema Pakaja and the NTV one. Anyway, I went on lots of these things. Like I, I was over, over sixty shows. It's pretty nerve wracking, actually. Like as an you know, being abused live on TV in front of seventeen million people for an hour. But anyway, um, you know, my Oxford Union debating skills 
<laughs> and superior in you know, moral authority and information that has saw me through. But the point is that um, you know th th this this media product has been like you know nutty and shouty and like let's nuke them out of existence. You know, in 2017, like they were the same. So so strange enough, if you're like a babushka sitting in Rupinsk, you know actually it's just sort of the same you know the, the same kind of like sort of red noise that you're getting from 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 the goggle box um and uh you know it's very well packaged um the storylines are remarkably consistent actually you know they they have high production values it's produced by extremely talented uh, totally cynical people but i actually it's it, one of the interesting things is you see that actually even kremlin propaganda has uh you know has a serious you know has its limits so for instance like my former friend i'm sorry to say a guy called anton krasovsky uh, uh who was literally fired by margarita simanyan for being too ukrainian too anti-ukrainian i beg your pardon because he actually said that we should like sort of drown their children and That's sort right. of you know well, you know, so I mean, well, he has a serious cocaine problem. I think he was that. rehired uh, a few weeks later, there wasn't he? Surreptitiously, <laughs> yeah, but not, but, but I haven't seen him on air yet. But, uh, yeah. uh, but, but no, but I mean, he, he's 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 just like a you know, a, you know, a, an addict and just sort of one of these people that appears in in this kind of totalitarian environment you know the 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 sort of the extreme guy who wants to please everybody like sort of oh, me 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 i can be like more you know and you know tries to to to, to get famous and and well the character in the hunger games if you've seen that yeah. i mean a lot yeah. of them remind me of those yeah well furthermore speaking of the hunger games of course the um for anyone who's interested in any way in like what you know how bizarre and crazy and decadent and frankly terrifying the modern russia has become uh watch on julia davis on twitter or it's on youtube the new year's show recorded on december 10th i can i can tell you for a certain fact anyway but <laughs> a pre-recorded new year's show which is just so nuts it's so terrifying and so dystopic i i, I mean it's 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 one of the so so much in modern russia makes me wonder whether it's actually invented and scripted by like sort of people who are literally like sort of subversive ironists because it's so completely nuts i mean in a way it was though like party i mean sort of, sort of kov who uh, sort of kov who's the architect of um prior to uh obviously sort of 2014 i mean sort of kov was an absurdist dramatist wasn't he and a pr expert so in effect someone of that ilk is behind a lot of this uh puppetry and this puppet show yeah yeah well i mean i i, I think sudkov had, had slightly better taste i mean well ish i mean i don't know but the uh, um but it's interesting you mentioned sudkov because he, he's uh sudkov's career um uh uh, I mean, without getting into, into sort of, this, this is not inside baseball. It's actually a very important sort of general point about Russia. Is this guy Vladislav Sulkov? Indeed, he invented the whole idea of sovereign democracy. Has brought in, you know, he's been since two thousand and three. He was brought in to sort of stem the tide of popular revolution, the coloured revolutions, uh, to stop that from ever happening in Russia. And his solution was essentially uh, he was. As you say, he was a, he, he was he was he was a playwright, television producer. He was a PR manager. He was like an, a novelist, um, and he's like a classic nineteen nineties person insofar as he had like a fundamentally consumerist and totally postmodern attitude to ideology. So and totally cynical, by the way. Um, in the sense that you know, he would basically use anything. You know, he has his brief. You know, stop the youth of Russia being affected by sort of nasty western ideas that might make them come out on the streets so he just sort of created as the russians say in some sort of like a sort of you know a sort of soup of everything you know a bit of a bit of, sort of orthodoxy here a bit of soviet nostalgia here some like some war films some you know you know some soviet soap operas you know a bit of uh, you know a, a bit of sort of neocon paranoia you know all sort of mixed up together and that was 
as you rightly say, you know, if, you know, from that he concocted the Russian television media product and it did it extremely effectively. Um, but then, you know, sort of quit, quit the Kremlin um, in, in February of 2020. You know, right at the beginning of lockdown, you know, just before lockdown, he quit the Kremlin. So, you know, that sort of essential sort of postmodern consumerist pragmatic attitude to ideology was replaced by people who actually like believed this crazy nonsense. You know, it was actually like the believers, the old KGB believers actually sort of suddenly took charge. And now what really surprises me and shocks me and like uh, is how many people are willing to sort of ride this this sort of burning death cart, you know, off the edge of the cliff. Because, for instance, even um, uh, Patrician, what's his name anyway? There's a very famous Soviet comic called Patrician. Um, his first name, I embarrassingly forgotten, but they, uh, he was a guy who spoke out. There's a really famous moving speech of Patrician, a sort of concert of Patrician, the comic, in 1988. An audience of people saying, like, you know, we must take collective responsibility for the appalling war that we have started, for the young men that we have killed who will never become, you know, scientists and never become singers, so never become songwriters. You know, we have to mourn them. He's talking about Afghanistan, 1988. Scroll forward a generation. This same guy is now in a television studio at the New Year's show saying, um, if you like it or not, Russia is expanding with like sort of big cheesy grin on his face, like this sort of this like like, like sort of fat corrupt old toad. I mean, it's it, it's it's extraordinary the number of people who are just for reasons of their own. I think they all have their you know, various different reasons, but the, the the regime has just sort of swept up this whole sway the former liberals, you know, from Patrician, you know, through through sort of Gorf, you know, through Konstantin Ernst, who's the head of Channel One. You know, all these people, I'd sort of even Dmitry Medvedev, the former, um, the former prime minister and president, who was in you know, a big mates with, made a big show of like going to see Steve Jobs and like, you know, it was, it was all about modernizing Russia. And, you know, all these people are just suddenly, you know, in the death cult with we no sign. We saw this early of... on, though, didn't we? I mean, we saw this in the takeover of Raven TV. Um, it's, you know, you'd have expected such a vibrant uh, television station to lose all of its staff when it was basically, uh, you know, gutted and taken over uh, by by the Kremlin. But actually, it was only a few sort of headline figures who left, a, a few key journalists. Many at the lower tiers, you know, carried on working for the channel. Um, and that was early on before, you know, Putin was in his ideological phase. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 as as I constantly say, I mean, the uh, as 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 the, the the sad joke is is actually the only Russians that really care about Russia, and you know, passionately, um, are now all in Tel Aviv. All the ones that stayed, you know, like all my Jewish intellectual friends who like you know went to all the meetings and risked arrest and like sort of did all these things, like you know, supported Navalny. They all just like left, and so the people that are that stayed are you know essentially cynics. You know, it's all an power, yeah. and and so on. I mean, I'm sorry, and that, 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 that's that, that's uh, um, the the people who remain and to work for the Kremlin machine are mm. essentially cynics. A few of them are idiots. A lot of them are both cynical cynics and idiots. Um, uh, the 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 people who are outside the Kremlin machine who doesn't don't have a vested interest are just. You know, and one can understand them. Um, they just you know, see no reason to blow up their lives. Um, they're, they're getting on fine. They just want the whole thing to go away, either through victory or something. They just really don't want to think about it. But they are choices that we could certainly imagine making. I don't think either of us or we could imagine necessarily working for, you know, the Kremlin TV, unless we really believed in it. I mean, people may work for Fox News, for instance, you know, but, uh, you, know, um, you know, probably because they believe in it. But they, in this in this case... Um, the, the 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 real problem for Russia um, is that you know the half a million people or so who really cared and were actually politically engaged are now no longer in Russia. The people who are who who are left are either in a state of profound denial or um, are you know just sort of cynically riding this for their own for their own benefit. Um, um, and um, 
the um, you know, as Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. Russia is like so far. I've I've personally lived through like several enormous convulsions in Russia. I was coincidentally in Leningrad on 19th of August 1991. I was a, I was a first year undergraduate, and you know I saw what a revolution looks like in Russia. I saw half a million people on the streets of just newly renamed St. Petersburg in August of 1991. That's a revolution. But that came after six years of like economic deprivation, after a catastrophic loss of war, and most importantly, after uh, six years of glasnost, you know, which actually had you know, suddenly opened this Pandora's box of free speech. And a revolution happened. But my God, like it took them a long time to get there. I mean, they they can take a tremendous amount of punishment, and you know, then we're currently taking you know a very tiny and actually almost invisible amount of not even punishment, but sort of slight discomfort, you know, disruption to their holiday plans. That level of dis disruption. You know, I mean, they're... you preceded me by a year. I was there in ninety two, so in between, uh, you know, Gorbachev uh, being forced out and then the shelling of the white house the year after and it was uh yeah it felt cataclysmic at the time but but what's happening now feels far worse and that kind of leads me to the last question because you've painted this picture of the fact that you've got people who, who are acting like ostriches with their heads in the sand they're carrying on their lives pretending this isn't happening until it directly concerns them you've got people who are cynical you've got people who are stupid but there is another category and i think this is which, I mean, my view, I think, is that this is going to take the West by surprise because there is a, an active group, a politically active group in Russia, but they're not on the liberal wing. They're on the extreme nationalist wing. They've got telegram channels. They only have, they have the only semi-independent media outlets and they're angry and they're active and they believe uh, as you've said in your in your book, they actually believe in some of the sort of crazy mystical historical mythology uh, that underpins much of this invasion. Um, is it more likely that actually that Russia is going to go from taking a an authoritarian turn to actually an extreme nationalist turn as its next move? Well, uh, you, 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 you're absolutely right in the characterization um, uh, of 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 the, the main opposition to Putin is, and the main political threat comes not from the you know, Navalny pro-Western liberals, uh, but from the, the ultra nationalist right. That's certainly true. Um, I would also, but I would add like one thing to to to, to what you uh, preface that with, um, and that is that actually uh, the you know the cynics, the idiots, you know, parsing all of that. What we're talking about is is you know we're parsing the elite. There's actually a much larger part of Russia, which is essentially, you know, poor, provincial, you know, just ordinary, you know, good, bad, ugly, whatever. I mean, just just you know, ordinary people who, um, and I've travelled quite a lot in, in, in Russia, including just before the war, I went up to to Selikhard and um, um, uh, uh, Vurkuta and Ukhta, like the far north and so on. I mean, you know, these are just ordinary people trying to get by. They, they're very, and they have been told that the country is being attacked, therefore they support the war because they think they see it as a war of defense. Uh, what takes those other people to whom, you know, both Putin and his potential opponents are appealing. The problem is that as the Kremlin has actually adopted positions that were formerly, you know, in 2010, 2012, considered to be like radical internationalist positions adopted by the far right nationalist opposition have now gone mainstream, or rather the Kremlin has like moved there. And in that sense, they've actually opened this terrifying Pandora's box of ultra nationalism, you know, of our, you know, this this sort of extremely aggressive, bloodthirsty rhetoric um, has actually made put the Kremlin in a very vulnerable position. Um, and I think that you know anyone who is, you know, sensible to that threat and genuinely thinking about how the Putin regime, you know, can be, uh, you know, can be wound up or sort of replaced is definitely thinking of how to accommodate those people so you know how do we stop these this sort of you know, outside 
political movements from actually you know, taking over power, because literally that is a revolutionary situation, which is dangerous, not just for Russia, by the way, it was also dangerous for Ukraine. Let's not forget that. <laughs> um, and it's I mean, obviously there's the nuclear issue. So I mean that, that and and it's that fear of actually sort of avoiding a revolutionary situation in Russia, or like an actual collapse, that leads people like Macron to very controversially, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, very controversially say back in May, you know, we Putin must not be humiliated. You know, everyone was horrified. Like, how can we? Of course, Putin must be humiliated. But that's what he's talking about. Because actually, I've spoken to aides to Macron. They are very cognizant of that fact. Is that you know, Putin has to lose in Ukraine. Okay, they're coming round to that opinion now, and they're now sending. Famously, this week they started. They're, they're sending you know, infantry fighting vehicles, not tanks. By the way, people on Twitter, it's not a tank. It's got wheels. It's not a tank. <laughs> but the, um, you know, that Europe is coming around to the fact that they need to, the, the Ukraine needs to win on the battlefield, but they're still very concerned that actually the, the, what comes after Putin may be much worse. And in that sense, the, the historical analogy, again, as a historian, I'm very wary of historical analogies, but you know, they can be sometimes be useful. In this analogy, you know, Putin is not Hitler, he's Kaiser Wilhelm II. He's like the, you know, the idiot that leads his country into a disastrous and unwinnable war. Um, which is followed by a humiliating defeat, a massive nationalist anger, bad backlash, economic collapse, and then you have fascism and Hitler. So, I mean, that's that, that's definitely uh, a possibility. And on that cheerful note. <laughs> yes, it's a terrifying one, but I'm I think it's important. Yeah. It's terrifying, but I'm sorry to say, I mean, I, I can't deny that that's actually a real, a real, a real threat. I mean, I, I, I laugh, but only because it's because it's terrifying and yeah. unthinkable, and that, that doesn't happen. And that that's sort of definitely where I wanted to end up. I you know, I I I'd be almost none of the videos we've done this year. And this is video number ninety-nine. You know, very almost a hundred, but it's ninety-nine because I one was pulled out yesterday. But I think out of those, maybe sort of five percent have ended positively. And that's usually looking forward to Ukraine and its bright future. Um, none of them have ended positively um when it comes to conclude what's going to happen in Russia. And I think an element of cynicism in going to this with the open eyes. Uh, is is important um but i know we're out of time and owen um i'm very um appreciative that you've spent so much time uh you know sharing your experiences uh, on the channel i'd love to have you back on the channel because i feel there's a, a ton of stuff we could still talk about um but it's been brilliant talking to you likewise thank you very much